All righty. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. The title for tonight's teaching is Two Types of Mountains. Some of the verses we're going to look at is Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. In Galatians 4, 21 through 31. And the date is January the 12th, 2023. All right, this is interesting because this whole setup on the computer is different. Good evening, Renee. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for commenting. For the reactions that you put on. For the comments. For viewing. A great encouragement. So if we get into this. Um, there's some that... I know we're going to end up watching this later, different time, and thank you to those of you that watch this live, because it is different, just like uh, coming to our house on a Tuesday and us talking about this is different uh, than when you come here on Wednesday, and it's different when you watch it live, I typically do this live on Thursday, as well as then it's different if you just watch it not live. So uh, it's all good. And when you do it, well, D's here. We got D and Renee and I'm guessing Sharon will watch it on YouTube. And so, uh, hello to you all. And uh, so I find it interesting that um, even though it's the same, it's very different. And so, if we jump into this, this one... Um, <laughs> We'll see how, how it goes for you guys, because from my standpoint, when when I went through this, it was it it helped me to kind of really put some stuff into a, a better understanding, a better connection. And so hopefully it does the same for you. See, we think that we have a pretty fair enough understanding of this thing called Christianity. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Right as soon as I get started, Kevin and his wonderful bride Shelly tune it, chime in to say hello. All right, so lots of rain, so it's just not as much fun riding the motorcycle when it's raining out. And uh, so I'm glad that you get to tune in and that you are tuning in and helping all of us with your presence. And so thank you. And so now let's let's get into this thing, right? <sighs> when I read this, I I thought I had a good connection with when things happened and where and um Just an overall, you know, not everything, because there's still some things that are that are just like, that happened, what, when, uh, but 
this is way cool because we have some scripture to be able to really just kind of lay it out there. The title, Two Types of Mountains. The, the sheets that I print off, uh, at the very end, I ask, which mountain are you living from? Because the Bible describes two mountains, two lifestyles, two ways of living. And my experience, my understanding, my belief is way too many of us are living from the wrong mountain. And you might say that you're living from the right one. Your actions will actually show which foundation you have for your Christian life. Let's get into this. So Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24. Right off the top, right? Right off the bat, we get to knock one of the verses, the, the chunks of verses that I tacked um, onto this one. It says, for you have not come to a mountain. All right, so now let's, we're going to, we're going to go through verse 21. So 18 through 21. Let's describe one mountain. Okay. Uh, for you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and to the sounds of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. So, if you're not sure, this mountain that is being described is Mount Sinai. This place, which I have um, a bunch of verses that I'm just going to kind of hit or maybe summarize. I might read some of them, but uh, to be able to help us to understand just what took place on Mount Sinai. This first chunk, 18 through 21, is describing Mount Sinai. So, Old Testament. And we'll get into at least some, and you'll be able to really see what is attached to this mountain. And these first few verses, uh, the first few words in Hebrews 12, so Hebrews is the New Testament, after uh, Hebrews was wrote after Jesus had come and died on the cross and was raised again. The first few words in 18, it says, you have not come to this mountain. And let me describe to you, let me explain to you the mountain that you have not to. If you are, no. Not if. All right. Because you are a Christian. Because you have died and are born again. 
It's not something that you're waiting on. It's not something that's going to happen at some point in the future. It's not something that as long as you are um, clean enough and good enough. I heard uh, a quick quote from somebody, I, and, and I don't remember who it was. Uh, it was a pastor that had said, so now if, if you are out playing in the mud, do you clean yourself up before you take a shower? I thought it was great. That was awesome. Something to that effect. I was like, well, no. You get in the shower to clean yourself up. Come on. I'm going to wait just for a moment because there's a few of you out there. I'm like, what? See? There you go. Oh, yeah. See? What Jesus did for us is what cleans us up. Okay. Hebrews 12, 18 says, you did not come to this mountain. And then he goes on to explain what mountain it is. Mount, Mount Sinai. Come on. See, I love that. I mean, it's just like, what? Yes, I like it. All right. So instead, because again, two types of mountains. We've got we've got two mountains, two mountains, one, two. Doesn't matter. We have two mountains. There's two types of mountains. Which type of mountain are you actually actually living from? The first one. It's like, well, why would anybody pick that? That's kind of scary. No. Blazing fire, darkness, gloom, whirlwind. We got a blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which when the people heard it, they begged that no further word be spoken to them. And it was so terrible was the sight that the person that was elected to go up the mountain said that he's full of fear and trembling. And yet, so many live from this mountain. Some of you still live from this mountain. Just saying. Here's the second mountain. Two types of mountains. Talked about the one. Now verses 22 through 24. So Hebrews 12. 22 through 24, talk about the other mountain. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now there's a... Uh, There's quite a bit in describing the mountain that you have come to. Not that you can, not that you will, not that is out there. And if you do the right things, you can maybe achieve. If not, you'll be there after you die. And so all will be, all will be okay. No! No! This says you have come to Mount Zion. And then it goes on to explain the things, the, the places. What is this Mount Zion? 
Well, the city of the living God. Okay? The heavenly Jerusalem. Not the Jerusalem that's here in Israel. We'll get into that later. No. The Jerusalem that is on Mount Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem. Whole different deal. Just saying. Same name. You know, you know two people. Same name. Very different people. Just because they have the same name doesn't mean that everything about them is the same. That's the same same way with the heavenly Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem that we all know and understand where it is and everything. Okay. What else is in this Mount Zion? Myriads of angels. Now, I did not look to see what number myriads is. I just look at it as a number that you just really can't count. It's like how many grains of sand are on the seashore? Somebody can calculate it out. They're going to be wrong, but they can calculate it out. There's just a lot. Okay, to the General Assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Okay, that sounds like a nice place to be. And to God, the judge of all. This is Mount Zion. This is where you have come. Not where you will. This is where you are. Today, whenever your today is that you're watching this. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You know, we can get into that. But that's another teaching for another day. Um, all right, fine. I hear you. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly go with this. Uh, so in Hebrews 12, verse 23, right towards the back end of it, it says that it's, it's explaining, right? You've come to Mount Zion and this is, and, um, to the spirits of righteous made perfect. Uh, there is another place. I think it's in Romans. Right now, I'm not remembering. Maybe the end of Romans 8, 9, 10. It talks about uh, that your flesh is dead. Oh, wait a minute before I get there. D says, the word myriad comes from the Greek word, whatever, which means 10,000. Also, thought at times it referred to a large indefinite number. That's what Siri says anyway. Come on. Thanks, D. There you go. A lot. Just saying. You want to put that into thinking. It, it would not be the same as having 10,000 of your friends because your friends are pretty weak and pathetic when you compare them to what one angel can do. But anyway. So in this, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So in one of those verses, it, it speaks to the fact that your that your flesh is dead because of sin, and yet your your spirit is alive. And then it goes on to say, uh, "But the one who has the spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, um, not only is your spirit uh, going to be raised, but also your your body." But so this then would be speaking of those that only have the spirit that is in heaven and, and not the spirit and the body. Okay. So verse 24, and to Jesus. So Jesus is at Mount Zion. And which Jesus? Are we talking about um, Jesus? Right? I think that's how it is in Spanish. But yeah, 
Is it, is it, which, no, this Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. That's the Jesus that is at Mount Zion. And to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Uh, you think about the fact that um, back in the Old Testament, they would sprinkle the tabernacle and the book and the people with the blood of the sacrifice to cleanse it. And so this sprinkled blood that is at Mount Zion speaks even better. Okay. Let's talk about the first mountain a little bit so then uh, we can get at least some understanding, uh, kind of the path that I was, was brought on to be able to understand Mount Sinai. So the first few verses in Hebrews 12. What mount... What mountain is this talking about? If we go into Exodus, so into the Old Testament, so we take the Bible, and we say, all right, let's see here. Genesis, and we'll flip through Genesis, and then we get to Exodus, which is what we're talking about. Let's go to Exodus 19. In the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so there's our timeline. They all leave Egypt. because They were slaves. They get led out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. So in the third month after... They had gone out, out of the land of Egypt. So early on, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidium, oh, sorry if I offend somebody for not pronouncing that, that place um, correctly. Okay. They came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God. Right there, I'm like, wait a minute. I thought Moses only went up to count to up went up to get the Ten Commandments. That only happened once. He was only there for a short time. But no, this is three months after they had gone out of Egypt. Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you should say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of all the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So, I found that interesting that you know I bore you on eagle's wings. So if we go, I'm going to use this because I should be able to get there faster. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. So God says, I bore you on eagle's wings, and yet all those people walked. It's, 
it is it goes to help us to understand that some of these things that God says, we need to have a broader understanding. Because if we shoehorn him into that, that just those two would not match up. Because all of the what I understand to be about three million people altogether, men, women, children, left. Egypt, but they all walked. And here God says, I bore you on eagle's wings. But this, so, so this is happening in the third month after they leave Egypt, Mount Sinai, the foot of Mount Sinai. God is talking with them. Now, a little bit further down, so Exodus 19, the whole Exodus chapter 19 um, is, is filled with all sorts of stuff that is going on here, but I just took a, a few snippets of it so then we can kind of see in that Hebrews 12, 18 through 21, we find those things in here. Like in Exodus 19, 12, and 13, God tells Moses, here's what you're going to do. You're going to set boundaries for the people. It says, uh, you shall set boundaries for the people all around, saying, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain, shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So that's referring up to the other verses that talk about the fact that even if a beast touches it, it'll be stoned. And you've got the blast of the trumpet. <sighs> that doesn't sound all that inviting to me. I'm hearing this, and I'm all I'm not all that crazy about wanting to, to join in. I talked to a pastor many years ago and he was um, going after some stuff and I said but but where's the love and so I don't hear any love in this even though God is love, and we can get into that, because all of this is done, Mount Sinai is there because God is interacting with the people in a way that the people declared that's how they want the interaction to be between them and God, God and them. <clears throat> God's like, that's not the way I want to be. If that's what you want, that's how I'll be, but you're not going to like it. And so this is part of that. Okay, let's let's do some more. You know, I say this a time or two, but, you know, there's a possibility that this one might be one of my shorter teachings um, in uh, recent time. But we'll see. Uh, so we've got... That in Exodus 19, 12, and 13. Then if we look at verses 16 through 20. So it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a lo very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. 
and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went. So, more of... connecting it with what is being talked about in well that's not good what's going on well all of a sudden I get all these messages we lost you All right, good, I'm back. That is, well, yeah, there was, Sadi said, oh no, I lost you. That I did not see. It's really windy here, so that might be it. No, I don't know. It's just very strange because my whole setup is the same. Uh, my internet provider did get um, bought out, so maybe there's something with that. But um, this whole part is, and I'm not showing anything here that said that I lost the, the live connection, so. That's just weird to me, and I apologize for it not connecting well. So we're we're looking at all of this stuff that connects us to what happened on Mount Sinai. That the first those the eighteen through twenty one verses. Okay, well, I'm glad that I'm back. The 18 through 21 uh, verses in Hebrews 12 are very clearly talking about my, Mount Sinai. And so we're, we're, we're okay, yeah, Renee asked if I would repeat the 19, 12, 13. So in Exodus 19 verses 12 and 13 it says you shall set boundaries for the people all around saying beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death no hand shall touch him but he shall surely be stoned or shot through whether beast or man he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So you have this very not so inviting invitation. But it is very much this, this, this uh, more than just a line in the sand. And it is this connection that God has with his people not because that's the way God would prefer it, but because the people said, this is how we want to have our connection with you. And God's like, you're really not going to like that. And they're like, oh, yes, we will. This is going to be, and God's like, all right, I'll do it, but it's not going to be, it's, it's just not going to be good. And so 
we have this God that says, I am your God. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will tell you what to do, what not to do. I will tell you how close you can get to me. I will tell you whether you can come closer to me. I will tell you where you have to stop. I will tell you... Just just, just not all that. And I, I just... No. And I, it, it, it boggles my mind to think that anybody would be accepting and wanting, desiring to have God like that. How, why you would want to have that be how God is with you befuddles me. I think that'd be the, the word to go there. And then 19, 16. You bet, Renee. Absolutely. Exodus 19, 16 through 20 then. Fire, I pulled up some pictures uh, last night of where, I don't remember the, the name of it. They don't name, the, this mountain isn't named Mount Sinai, but probably is where this is talking about because the top of it is blackened. And there's some argument as to how that happened. You know, maybe some volcanic stuff happened. And it's like, well, really? Because if God comes down, Right, descended upon it in fire, that would kind of be kind of like a volcanic, but anyway. <clears throat> so you have this stuff, and it's matching up with Hebrews 12, 18 through 21, talking about this is Mount Sinai, that, that it says, you have not come to this mountain. Okay, now if we go uh, in Exodus, go to chapter 24, verse 16, it says, The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses from the midst of the cloud. So that works. <clears throat> In Exodus 31, 18, it says, When he, so when God, had finished speaking with him, Moses, upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. He was up there, I believe, for 40 days. He was up there for a while. He gets these tablets. By the time he comes back, the people are worshiping a golden calf that they had made. And they were saying, this is where God is. This is, and Moses isn't all that pleased. He throws the tablets down. So then God talks to him again. He says, all right, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cut out two more tablets. Thank you, D. D said yes, 40 days. So God says, All right, Moses, cut out two more tablets, two more, two more stone tablets, and bring them up, and I'll write them out again. So Exodus 34, verse 4. So he cuts out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took the two stone tablets in his hand. Everybody was around this mountain for a long time. 
it wasn't just a few hours, a few days. God had been talking with Moses. Then eventually then Moses goes up, hangs out there for 40 days. Can you imagine? Anyway, we can, No, we're not going to go down that road. All right. Gets the tablets, 40 days, comes back, and then another time lapses. And then he goes back up, gets the Ten Commandments, wrote out in stone again. Again, Mount Sinai. Which mountain are you living from? Ooh, that hurt. I know, Todd. I I know. I know. You, you're, I, you're like, Todd, that hurt. I'm pointing out, what mountain are you living from? Well, just because it's on Mount Sinai doesn't mean we're not supposed to still follow it today. I don't know. Hebrews 12 says, you have not come to this mountain and is clearly describing Mount Sinai. Instead, it says, you have, clearly you have come to this mountain which is Mount Zion. Which mountain are you living from? Like I said early on, a lot of you are living from Mount Sinai. <clears throat> few more verses here. Let's see. Exodus 34 verse 29 says, it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with God. So Moses' face was glowing like a lightning bug's butt. You can say that... No, we're not going to... Okay. So he's glowing. He's not realizing it. He's not seeing it. But when other people look at him, they can see it because he had been speaking with God. So again... Mount Sinai. Here's something else. Mount Sinai, and then we're close to moving on. But how about this one? Leviticus. Oh, the wonderful book of Leviticus. I'm joking. Leviticus is, well, here is five verses from Leviticus. Uh, so uh, Leviticus Chapter 27, verses 30 through 34. Thus, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If, therefore, a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. Or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. It shall not be redeemed. Check this out. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel. Where? It says at Mount Sinai. So all of the rules, all of the law, because I only picked one thing. All of that stuff was given to them at Mount Sinai. 
they were there probably for a little while. But that to me just kind of blew my mind. It made sense to me. It lined up. But it was, you have got to be kidding me. And yet, there it is. All right, I am going to read Psalms, but let's let's look at Acts. So the book of Acts into the New Testament. Acts chapter 7, verse 30, it says, For after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flaming of a burning thorn bush. So that him is Moses. Moses leaves. I believe he's doing some sheep herding. And he's looking for some sheep, and he sees this bush burning. Not a good thing. And as he gets closer to it, he realizes that the bush is burning, but the bush isn't burning. Now, that'll melt your noodle. So that happens at Mount Sinai as well. There is Mount Sinai. So we have two types of mountains. And which mountain are you living from? Let's look at Psalm 2, verse 6. Here's what God says. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. God, how did you put it? How is it? Um, God ascended, God descended onto the mountain. God, God was at Mount Sinai. That was where he was talking to Moses. That's where he was wanting to talk to his people. It's where he set up the boundary. That's where he gave them all the rules and the regulations to follow for life. He goes, you want a God like this? Here's how it's going to be. This is what you can eat. This is what you can't eat. This is what you can touch. This is what you can't touch. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. This is when you can do it. This is when you when you can't do it. All of those came from God at Mount Sinai. And in Psalm, he says, as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion. My holy mountain. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys are getting some of this and you're thinking, well, Todd, this is really easy. I am obviously I'm I, I'm living from the, the right mountain. I've been a Christian for longer than you've been alive. I've been a Christian for longer than you have. I've been a better Christian than you have. I've been, what? And it's like, you obviously. Are living from. Mount Sinai. Oh, man. Not as guilt, shame, condemnation. Okay, this is to open your eyes being a Christian doesn't matter it's a heck of a statement D this the way that I'm talking the things that we're talking about is to help you realize where you are at 
in life. Because you're in life really living from the base of Mount Sinai. Oh, come on, see? He said it, Jesus does. Being a Christian doesn't matter. Jesus matters. Because now, so, that beautiful. Let's, let's look at, at 2 Corinthians then. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. New Testament. And see, hear, the two types of mountains. Both mountains that are before you, and you say, you're told, you get to pick which one you want to live from. Second Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. And yeah, I probably won't get through all the verses, but until I, before I stop, but let's see. Listen for the, are we, can we hear, we pick up on Mount Sinai. Can we see, hear, feel, grab hold of where it talks about Mount Zion instead? Let's see. But if the ministry of death, in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory on his face, fading as it was. So that's just verse 7. Hopefully everybody went... I got it. Mount Sinai. Glowing face. And so this glowing speaks of glory. It's all right. Okay. So if that had, if that came with glory, verse eight, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory. Come on. Now let's go back. So there, Mount Zion. Okay. Now verse 9. Let's go back and do the comparison again. The two types of mountains. Verse 9 says... For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Verse 10. Oh, this is just crazy. So hopefully it... You get it because all right. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. Come on. So if Mount Sinai was good, if Mount Sinai carried power and authority, if Mount Sinai was right for the people to live by. If that is the case, and it is, then it says, how much greater is all of those things in Mount Zion? How much greater power greater authority, greater way to live. How much 
more. It is so much more that the glory that the first one have had has. It's reduced to having no glory because Mount Zion is so much greater. <sighs> okay, verse 11. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Here's another side note with this. Under the old covenant, uh, you did something wrong, you would have to bring a sacrifice, and then that cleansed your flesh for a year. Never cleanse your mind. So, fading. It had an expiration date. All right. You're good for this amount of time. Plus, then the high priest would do sacrifices and offerings um, for himself as well as for all of the people, which was only good because he only one high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And so that stuff was only good for a year. And it only dealt with your flesh, not your spirit, not your mind, not your conscience. It says, how much greater is what we get from Mount Zion that not only cleanses our body, but also cleanses our conscience? Cleanses our conscience, our mind, our spirit. We are now cleansed by God. And whatever God has cleansed, nobody should call unclean. Okay, let's see. All right, let's keep going. Uh, verse 12 says, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Again, we are not like Moses. We are not the people that came to Mount Sinai. You have not come to Mount Sinai. You have come to Mount Zion. Let's see, verse 14. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. So if I stop right there, that's end of 14. You want to know where you're at in this? Does the forgiveness of God have an expiration date? In your life, in the things that you've done, does God's forgiveness have an expiration date? If most of you are honest, most of you would say yes, because it expires the next time that person or I do something bad. then what God has done has expired. And you're right, Renee, it doesn't. It doesn't have an expiration date, but we live, too many of us, live in that realm that it has an expiration date, which tells you 
you are living with a veil on your heart. Because you're living from Mount Sinai instead of Mount Zion. Because what he did 2,000 years ago is just as potent today and will be tomorrow. And yet, we say, I'll, I'll forgive you, brother. I, I, so, I forgive you because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God tells us to do. Now, that's the right words for some people. In this case, it wasn't. It was very much, I will forgive you as long as you don't do this, you do this. Here's the border. Mount Sinai. Come on, Jesus. Thank God I live from Mount Zion. Come on. Woo! Okay. Let's read the rest of this, and then we'll move on. So much for this one getting done a little bit uh, early. Kevin says, have to truly mean it. Yep. And so there's, there is this, you can just tell. And some people... They can say it half-heartedly, and that is truly the best that they have. I 100% accept that. Because we live from this stance that what I see with my eye and what I hear from my ear is not what I go by. I tell by your heart. And then my response is from my heart. So, all right. So verse 15 says, um, But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Come on, living by faith. That's right. Here it is, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Other translations, versions say, there is freedom. And 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So you see, can you, can you see that? Living from Mount Sinai versus living from Mount Zion? All of this work stuff, all of this, here's the border. God says, if you cross this, you're going to die. I'm going to tell you when you get up. I'm going to tell you when you're going to go to sleep. I'm going to tell you how far you can walk. I'm going to tell you what you can eat, what you can't eat. I'm going to tell you because this is what's good for you. <clears throat> and now, is all of that right and true? Absol absolutely it is. It's just that you can't follow it. <sighs> All right, let's get to the other verses. Come on. Isn't that crazy? D says I can see it clearly now. I mean, isn't I mean just these these few little verses? You could read through them and it's just like, yep, all right, whatever, whatever. But now when you when you go, wait a minute, Mount Sinai, I get it. Okay, picture. I have a better description, better understanding, better knowledge of Mount Sinai. Got it. Now, when we read scripture, 
we're like, oh, I'm connecting that with Mount Sinai. Now, where can I connect with Mount Zion instead? There's an awful lot here, Todd. There's an awful lot that is connecting with Mount Sinai. Give me something. Give me this little bit, because there's a little bit here, because it does say. The same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. Come on, Revelation. I love it. That veil is removed. That border, that boundary, that spot that God said, if anything, man, creature crosses it, they will surely die. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to die. Which is going to allow me to be the gate into the presence of the Father. All right. So much with this. But let's go on Galatians then. Here's the other verses that I connected with this Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. <laughs> it starts out, he says, Tell me. You, who want to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? <laughs> Come on. That's right. Jesus is enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you not listen to the law? And now the next verses compare, contrast, however, the two mountains, and he uses two people's lives to show these two mountains. Mount Sinai, the law. He says, really? You want you you want to be under the law? Do you not listen to the law? Well, here. Let's let's look at it this way. And then he says in verse 22, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And the son by the free woman through the promise. So now if I pause right there, both, because we're talking about um, Hagar and Sarah. Um, Abraham gets the word that says you're going to be the father of many nations, so much so that you're not even going to be able to count all of the, uh, the people that are going to come from you. And it goes about and nothing happens. Sarah says, hey, you know what? Here's what we can do. I got my maidservant. You guys sleep together. And then she can produce offspring for you. And then that can, can happen. Yep, bond and free says a lot. So you have the bond woman, Hagar. Has a son, Ishmael, I believe. We'll get into it, but I'm pretty sure that was, that was who it is. I found out today, it was like 13 years later. The prophet comes back and says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. No. Sarah is going to conceive. No, Sarah was like 90 something, 90, whatever. And she had never bore any children. So even if they live for, you know, two, 300 years, 90 is still old because it even says that she was past childbearing years.
Let's see. Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. Well, free, she was, Sarah was still his wife. Sarah gets pregnant, has Isaac. Says, Todd, what's this? Because we're, we're talking about mountains, not kids and women and stuff. Well, the bondwoman, the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Now, both sons were born by the way that we understand it, the way that we understand how children are born. Both women. Verse 23, but the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And the son by the free woman through the promise. It explains this. Watch this. Verse 24. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai. Bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. Slavery. Think someone, something else telling you how to live, what to do, what not to do. It's not your life. You are in slavery. This is how far you can go. When I say jump, you better jump. Bondwoman, slave. Verse 26, check this one. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, Mount Zion. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Here you go. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. Just saying, if you're going to get some pushback, it's going to be from somebody who is living from Mount Sinai. That's who is going to give you the most problems. Saying. Verse 30. But what does Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman. Come on. And her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Come on, man. You have Mount Sinai, Hagar. It's a transactional relationship. The law. Right? Do this, get this. So do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. If you do this, you will get this. Versus a relational 
this Mount Zion is this personal, intimate, direct relationship. It says that Mount Zion is where is it the living God, I believe is how it is put. The city of the living God. Okay, just a couple other verses. So hopefully you're getting this here. Um, again, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. In Revelation 3, verse 12, it says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. <laughs> That's awesome, guys. So we have the new Jerusalem. Are you waiting for the new Jerusalem to come down yet? Really? Because if you are, hmm, let's see. I think you might be hanging out in Mount Sinai. <coughs> because <coughs> back in Hebrews again, it says you have come to Mount Zion. the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem when you are living this life from a spirit instead of from your flesh. You have come. Not you will be. Not someday. Often. You know what? I heard another pastor say this. If you are living from a someday in the future that will happen, you, he didn't say all this, but if you are living in that realm, you are still living from the base of Mount Sinai. You are still living from the law. You are still living as a child of the bondwoman instead of the free woman. It says that he who overcomes. Now, how do we overcome? Oh, yeah, that's right. Because the one who overcomes is the one who believes that what Jesus did is enough. That's not full scripture, but that is the essence of what it is for us to overcome. So he who overcomes, the person who overcomes. Okay, let's see. I'm going to overcome because I'm going to clean up before I take a shower to clean off the dirt that I cleaned up. So the shower doesn't clean me up. I've cleaned me up. So No, see? That's that performance mentality. No. He says, I have cleansed you. I have washed you clean. The shower washes the dirt off of you. He says, I'll make that person a pillar in the temple of my God, and that person will not go out from it anymore. Oh, you think you're a yo-yo Christian. You think you're in one minute, out the next. You think that yourself got you clean enough and now you made yourself dirty so that you got kicked back out of the family again and then you did enough good stuff to overcome the bad stuff that you did so now you're back in and then you had a bad thought, you did a wrong deed, you did something else and then now you're back out again. No, this verse says you will not go out from it anymore. Because once you understand that it wasn't you that got you saved, 
It wasn't you that got you good enough to be, to have your name wrote in the book of life. It wasn't you that got you into heaven. It wasn't you that got you or kept you. Come on. That's right, Renee. It wasn't you. Once you understand that, then there's no, I am, I'm not. I'm, I'm clean, I'm dirty. I'm wishy, I'm washy. Oh, see? Because you stand on the solid rock now. Now it's not you that has done it, but you believe that what Jesus did is enough for you. And that is what allows you to stay in the temple of God and no longer go out from it. So there we go. So we got the new Jerusalem. So that's one of the things that talks about, that is connected with Mount Zion, is the New Jerusalem. The free woman, her children, are children of promise. And we are children of promise because it's been promised to us. Now this last chunk, we go all the way towards the back. All right, so we're here. Revelation, that was what we talked about, Revelation 3. Let's go to Revelation 21. So there is 22 chapters, so we're not quite to the end, but we're pretty darn close. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. Let's see if you can find... the two mountains or at least one of them. Which mountain more so is being described here? Because Mount Sinai is described a little bit in this. But let's see. So Revelation 21 verses 1 through 7. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful <laughs> and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I, here, here is, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. 
He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son, or they will be my children. Two types of mountains. Which one realistically, which one are you, have you been living from? Which one would you like to? Still want to be living from Mount uh, Sinai? you will live with a veil over your heart. That's the way that it is. Because Jesus is the only one, and it's it, it says, in Jesus. That's what takes the veil away. Mount Zion. That is the mountain that you have come to. It's not a mountain that you can see like this. Okay? Because this is on the spiritual side of things. So, in wrapping this thing up, it says, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. He's the Go between. He's the one that makes the two sides that are opposed to each other come together. Reconciled. He's the mediator. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. New rules. You don't like the word covenant? Try changing that to rules. Come on. I love it, Renee. Thank you. What an encouragement. So if you hear that, new covenant, new rules. Are the old ones still in play? Absolutely. Absolutely. For those who still live on Mount Sinai, still have to have rules. The challenge is, most of the people that want to live by those rules aren't Jews. So the rules were only set up for the people that are Jews. Because the Gentile was far from God. The mountain that you have come to is Mount Zion. The rules, the new rules that you live by. Come on, D. Thank you for the encouragement. The new rules, the new foundational principle of life that you live by is love, mercy, grace. That's how you live. That's the life that you live. Because Jesus is enough. It does not mean that you're a doormat, that you get walked all over, that you're allowed to be the punching bag of somebody else, verbally or physically. All that stuff is garbage. What it means is you can interact Come on, Kevin. I appreciate it. Kevin, Shelly, you guys are great encouragement for me, so thank you for those words. 
what it means is that we can stand strong and we can stand tall. And it says that we can speak with boldness. And the speaking and boldness might not be with words, but in action. And our action might be to turn around and leave. The action might be not to return that phone call, not to send that text, not to post that message on somebody else's social media or on your own. It might mean that when you do, and you find out that, no, okay. What it means is we get to love one another. And we still have a long ways to go to understand what love is. So I refer everyone back to chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read that. It's, it's broke out. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. And then even go even further, take the word, maybe read it in a couple different translations, versions, to see if love is patient, if they use something different than patient. Look and see what, you know, Google, what does patient mean? Uh, what does the other word mean? Um, just have an idea. And trust, rest in the fact that Holy Spirit can guide you in living this life with having the foundation of love. Because through love, mercy and grace abound. Mercy and grace are there. And that means, that means, and then I'll wrap up, that means that people will screw up. Because if they didn't, you would not need mercy and grace. Just saying. Throwing that out there. So we love. We show mercy and grace. Because now our foundation is that we understand that we have come to Mount Zion. We are no longer a part of the bondwoman. We are no longer a part of Mount Sinai. They are two completely separate mountains. There's two types of mountains. Which one, because you're not living from both, you're lying to yourself, if you think you're living from both, if you think you're living from both, I will tell you right now, you are living from Mount Sinai. You don't get to have a foot in each camp. It's not how this thing works. If you think you do, you're trying to fool yourself and other people. Because I'm telling you, both feet are firmly planted in Mount Sinai. If that's your thinking, that's where you're at. Just saying. Okay, people. Thank you so much for viewing this, for, for watching this live, for tuning in whenever you can. After this live deal, I greatly appreciate and I'm encouraged by each one of you. All of the comments, the reactions. When you share this, when you point people to um, <clears throat> this um, Facebook page and or the YouTube channel, Unshakable Foundation, uh, we have uh, people that are subscribing to that and watching that. Um, it's a huge encouragement because... I understand that you will get to have a much better, greater relationship with God when you understand Mount Zion is where you are, not Mount Sinai. Nobody wanted to go to God in Mount Sinai. 
they're freaking out. They're like, don't even talk to me. I don't even want to hear it. Mount Zion is so open and loving that you know whether you had a great day or a bad day, you get to come running in, barging in, <clears throat> bust open the doors, and come running to sit on daddy's lap. So you can be comforted if it's not such a good day. Or you can share your excitement because it was a pretty good day. And everything between. Because that's what we get when we understand we live from Mount Zion. That's where we came. That's where we are. Come on. I, there just isn't anything more precious. I want to come and jump up on Daddy's lap and sit there and just share my day with him. This is the good. This is the bad. This is how I feel. This is how that made me feel. This is how this happened. This is what was going on. This just everything and have that full connection with him. Come on. Oh, all right. Whew. Yes. See, there is this, just this. And you cannot have that when you believe that we're still living in a Mount Sinai. Can't do it. Because you're always like, all right, well, you know, I, I'm going to come before you, and you know, I, I, I know that I can, I can, I can come before you now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, just, just know, I, I really did try, just, 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 I'm, I'm, just, just know, you know, I, I, I know, you know, I'll do better tomorrow, you know, if you keep me around, you know, I'll, 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 I'll try harder, I'll do better. No, that's the God that God has to be to those that are living from Mount Sinai. But we, and it's open to everyone. It's not a exclusive club. It's an inclusive club. Come on. He said, if only everyone knew this. What a different world this would be. Amen. Come on. That is so absolutely true. And that's what God wants. He wants everybody to understand. They can come running to him and sit up on his lap. And there isn't this guilt, shame, and condemnation. And that he will hug them because he is proud of them. Because he is a good God. Because he's not in that realm of I have this boundary and you can only come this close to me and I will tell you even if you can come this close and you have to do these things and you have to do them right and you have to do them this many times and you have to do that he will be that God to you which is why it's confusing to some people to most people he will be that God to you it's just that he does not have to be that God to you and he changes how he interacts with you. Because once you believe that what Jesus did is enough, it's all it takes. It doesn't take 40 years of everything. What it takes is you believing that what Jesus did is enough. That opens you up to being able to be in the presence of God without fear of what is going on in your life or what has gone in your life. That allows you to come into the loving kindness of who God is. 
So with that, I'm going to say thank you again for tuning in. Thank you for sharing these. Thank you for being you. Understand that God loves you this much. He made a way. He made a way when there was no way. He made a way. Jesus is the gate that allows us to be in the presence of the Father without fear of retribution. That we get to be blessed because what Jesus did is enough. And that we get to be love, be loved, and show love because what Jesus did is enough. All right. So thank you again. Obviously, I was a little off by my thinking on how long this one was going to go, but I'll tell you this right now, it went as long as it was supposed to. So thank you all. What a great encouragement you all are to me and to others. Um, when you are here watching this live, it's noticed. And when you watch it um, at other times, it's noticed. It is wonderful that you are a part of this family. And I thank you for that very much. Hopefully you can feel that in your heart, that it's not just words. Like Kevin, I think, said earlier, you know, it's something that you, you, know, you have to mean it. And hopefully you can feel it when I say thank you. All right, everyone. How about we do this? next time as well. All right. Bye for now.